the last six seven videos would have given you theoretical tools to understand the market phenomena and and what is the market phenomena how are prices and quantity traded determined and how and why do they change and in this lecture what i'll do is we'll go through some selected real world examples and this is only to highlight the significance of the tools that we have developed i'll just use a few real world examples and what you can do is you should apply these tools to some other examples let us look at two examples from a market which fascinates me and it is the labor market and when we are studying labor market we what we can do is we can put quantity of labor on the horizontal axis and the price of labor which happens to be wages on the vertical axis now suppose you have some kind of a special skill or a talent which nobody else has in such a case what will your labor supply curve look like it will be a vertical labor supply curve and let me just place this at the right spot and this is your labor supply curve so let me just write ls which represents labor supply and why is it vertical you have a unique skill or a talent and for this you do not know how much you are worth you could work for very little or you could work for a whole lot and you won't mind getting say millions of dollars for the talent you have now <clears throat> suppose for the skill that you have the demand is not too much let's just call this d0 and at this demand curve if this is the demand curve for the skills that you have your wages will be given by this point on the vertical axis and you know how do we get it that is the intersection of supply and demand curves for labor now <clears throat> suppose there's a tremendous interest in the kind of skill that you have and the demand for your skills that you have is now d1 and what will be the equilibrium point it will be e1 and how much will be the wages earned by you it will be w1 which is much higher than what you had initially so if you have a special unique skill or a talent which no one else has how much you'll be compensated would entirely depend upon the demand conditions and if there's too much interest in your kind of skill then chances are you'll make a lot of money and if there's not much interest in the skills you have you'll probably make very little money and let me give you one example from the country where i come from and that is the example of a very popular sport called cricket and this is very popular in the british commonwealth countries so like england australia canada and so on now when i was growing up the top cricketer in india used to receive a compensation of something like 50000 dollars or so this is in the 1970s and what is the situation today in india a top cricketer that plays for just 3 or 4 weeks receives 3 to 4 million dollars or there has been a substantial increase in the compensation received by indian top indian cricketers so why has this happened initially when i was growing up in india the demand for cricket was not much people were still enthusiastic about it but it had not been commercialized and now what has happened is there is a very significant increase in interest in terms of watching cricket matches and the result has been the compensation of cricketers has increased a lot so this is how we could explain 
the phenomena where people have very unique skill sets. Now let us look at another example from the labor market. So once again, we have quantity of labor on the horizontal axis and wages on the vertical axis. Now suppose you have skills which are undistinguishable in the sense, whatever skills you have, there are millions of people who have same or similar skills. In such a case, your labor supply curve will be horizontal. It'll look something like this. And so let's call this labor supply. LS, labor supply. Now, and so the wages you will get would perhaps be something like minimum wages. Why? Because at this wage, you'll find a lot of people with similar skill sets, minimum wages. Now, in this case, suppose there is an in, there's some demand curve. Let's draw this. And let us call this demand curve D0. And wherever this demand curve meets the supply curve, we have equilibrium in the labor market. You bring this point to the horizontal axis and what this represents is the number of workers that will be hired given the demand D0. Now suppose the economy is doing extremely well and now the demand curve for say workers who do not have any kind of distinguishable skill sets. In such a case, the demand curve now is D1. And wherever these two intersect, the demand and the supply curves intersect, we have new equilibrium point. And we drop this point to the horizontal axis. And what we have determined is how many workers will be hired at D1. So compare this diagram to the one we had previously. Now, if you have some kind of unique skill sets and there's a substantial increase in demand, your compensation will go up. In this case, when you are like millions of others, in such a case, an increase in demand would simply mean, an increase in demand would simply mean more and more people will get hired and there'll be no change in your compensation. Now let us use demand and supply framework to study another industry called computer industry. And let us make this comparison between 2016, the current year with say 1980. And what you'll observe is the following. Over time, there has been a very significant decrease in price of computers and there has been a very significant increase in quantity traded of computers in the sense more and more people own computers. Now, now how can we explain this in terms of our framework? Suppose the subscript is zero represents the situation in 1980. So we had this price at equilibrium, quantity traded at equilibrium in 1980. And then you have the demand and supply curves in 1980. Now, in 2016, what has happened is the following. There has been an increase in demand for personal computers. So the demand curve for personal computers has shifted to the right. And let us call this D1, one representing the present year, which is 2016. So there has been an increase in demand for personal computers. What about supply? The supply side has shifted a lot more than what we have on the demand side. And so we have this supply curve. And let us call this S1. Now we have a new demand curve D1 and a new supply curve E1, S1. And so we have this new equilibrium point E1 in 2016. And so Based on this equilibrium point E1, what we have is 
the price at equilibrium as PE1. And what you observe here is as compared to 1980, there has been a decline in price of computer in 2016. What about quantity traded? You drop this equilibrium point E1 to the horizontal axis and you have determined quantity traded in 2016 QE1. And so what you find here is in 2016, as compared to 1980, there has been a significant decrease in price of a personal computer and a significant increase in quantity traded of personal computers. Now, the key thing here is to understand why the demand curve shift has been lower than the supply curve shift in the case of computer industry. Now, why has demand curve shifted? We know people have gotten more and more used to using computers or computing facilities. Like we cannot live without emails, we cannot live without the internet and so on. And so there has been a change in tastes and preferences of people in favor of computers. What about the supply side? The supply side has shifted a lot more and this has happened mainly because of very significant technical progress in the computer industry and this has brought down or increased the supply of computers very significantly. So since the supply shift has been greater than the demand shift, what we have observed in the case of computer industry is there has been a decrease in price and an increase in quantity traded. So this is how we use this framework to analyze real world situations and this is what you should do uh, and apply this framework to any situation that you encounter. This completes our discussion of the market phenomena. Thank you for your time.